Okay, well, <clears throat> good morning, and uh, welcome back to True Grace Bible Ministry. Uh, my name is Michael Archeski, and uh, great to have you guys uh, with us. And last time we were together, we were talking about the ministries of the Twelve and the Apostle Paul not being the same. So we're going to continue on with that and, you know, continue to answer this question of why Paul? which many people today want to um, not accept that Paul is our apostle and that he received direct revelation from the risen Savior for us today, uh, which is his church, the body of Christ, which is not the same as that Jerusalem church. Yes, we're all in the kingdom of God together, but within that kingdom of God, you, you have uh, the prophecies concerning the nation of Israel, and then you have the mystery of the revelation concerning the church, the body of Christ, okay, all being in the kingdom of God, but still being separate entities, okay, and that's what we're going to continue on today about are these teachings the same, meaning the teachings that the twelve, and you know, Peter was the head of that. Uh, group, did they teach the same things that the Apostle Paul teaches? So that's where we're going to start today. So, did Peter and the others teach the same as Paul? So, first thing we're going to look at is Peter and the other apostles preached to Israel about the coming of the times of restitution and the refreshing. Okay, the times of refreshing. And why did he have to preach that? Because we go back, and you know, we're not going to look at that, but we're going to look at these passages of when they're preaching these things, because the day of the Lord, the day of Pentecost, talks about the great and notable day of the Lord. There is going to be a time of tribulation. There's going to be a time of Jacob's trouble, okay, where God's going to pour out his wrath upon the nation of Israel. And that's what uh, Peter and the Twelve were preaching here. And they preached that since the world began. So let's look at Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. We'll jump in at verse 19. Acts 3. In verse 19. It says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So, it's repent, you know, change your mind who this Jesus of Nazareth is. And, and just to refresh things, uh, in verse 12, he's speaking, ye men of Israel. This is what Peter's addressing. Okay? We must see these things clearly. Uh, down to verse 20. It says, And he shall say in Jesus Christ, be, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Okay? So, this is what Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. Alright? And he was giving them an offer of the kingdom. And if they accept their Messiah, then these things would happen. And their sins would be blotted out. They wouldn't have remission any longer, but they would be blotted out according to Jeremiah 31, which is about the new, excuse me, the new covenant with the nation of Israel. And once again, we do not follow under that covenant, okay? Um, let's look back to Luke, chapter 1. Luke, chapter 1, and look at verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by all by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. So here again, it's it, it, it's Luke, okay, writing about what Zacharias is prophesying about. And it's about Israel, isn't it? Okay? That he's going to raise up a horn of salvation. And then they're going to be delivered from their enemies. They will have remission of sin. 
Okay. In verse 77, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. See that? He's speaking, he's prophesying about Jesus Christ coming. And that was the purpose at that time, that Christ, and he died on the cross. And we looked at it many times, that they would have remission of sin at the time they were preaching this. Um, go back to Matthew, and we'll just, we'll see that again. We've talked about it numerous times. But Matthew 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, break it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. See, now, the New Testament, uh, the new way, God's new will, if I may, okay, which makes clearly se clear sense, and we've talked about covenant and testament in the past. Um, go back and take a look at it, at TGBM 1000. But, his blood was shed for the remission of sins on that day. And then when Peter comes in, he offers them the kingdom. And if they would accept it, then the new covenant from Jeremiah would be enforced. And they would have their sins blotted out. But on that day, some 2,000 years ago, okay, it was for them to have remission of sins at that time. Until the new covenant be enforced and their sins be blotted out. Okay, um, let's come back uh, to Luke for a second and just to show who uh, Zechariah is prophesying about and Luke is writing about in verse 80 of Luke chapter 1 it says the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. See, now he's talking about John the Baptist but his showing was to Israel and that's what John the Baptist uh, was to prepare the way of the Lord. That was his ministry. That is why he is called the greatest of all of the prophets. Why? Because he prepared the way of the Messiah for Israel. Okay? For Israel. And these things were spoken of since the world began. Now, let's see the difference of what Paul preached. Paul was proclaiming and preaching proclaiming the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Okay, and it was hid in God. See, a lot of people say, well, well, it was hid in the scriptures. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says it was hid in God in time past. Okay, so uh, Romans 16, Romans 16 And verse 25, it says, Now to him that is power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. See, now this all nations is Gentiles. Excuse me, including Israel, okay? Israel is included in that Gentile world today. Because everybody in the sight and the eye of God is a Gentile today. And all unbelievers are heathen. God is not, um, he does not look at that nation of Israel in any special way today. Yes, sovereignly, is he protecting them? And is, he, is Israel still their people? Of course they are. But they've been cast away, they've been set aside as that nation. Okay, until, okay, until when? Let's look at Romans 11. Okay, so we, we can answer that question. When is this going to end, this dispensation of grace? We don't have a time. Like these people now want to say the world's going to end. i just seen something, um, 2018 is the, the year of death or something. I have no idea what they're talking about. But look at... Uh, Romans 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So that's when this dispensation is going to end. And that God, as we say, will pick up 
that prophecy um, program, if I may, um, with Israel again. And that's when we see what Peter was preaching back there in Acts about the time of restitution and the refreshing of all things. Okay? Uh, that will be, be being preached again. And then James, Peter, John, uh, Jude, and the book of Revelation, all those books, okay, will be applicable at that time again to those folks. As we, the church, the body of Christ, will be caught up and will be with the Lord forevermore. Okay? And then the prophecy that was given to Israel will continue and then it will be fulfilled. Okay? It will be fulfilled, but it hasn't been yet. So, these things have been kept secret that Paul is preaching to us. The things that Peter and the boys preached, if I may, um, have been spoken since the world began. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God. Not in the scriptures, but in God. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. So, this fellowship, okay, of Jew and Gentile in one body, okay, was kept secret. Because we know in time past, there, there was hostility uh, between the Jew and Gentile. But now it's to be the fellowship in one body, the twain, one new man. Okay, the church, which is his body, in this dispensation of grace. Um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Where I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, God giving commands out to us, to me, for you, to fulfill the word of God, to complete the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is manifested to the saints. Okay? See, this is the difference between prophecy and mystery. Okay? And now we're to preach Jesus Christ according to this revelation of the mystery which was given to the Apostle Paul. So, I do not see these two um, preachings, um, proclamations, however you want to word that, being the same. Because one was spoken since the world began, one was kept secret. Okay, let's continue on and look at this so-called Great Commission. Okay? Uh, the Twelve, we know, operated under a distinction between Jew and Gentile. Okay? There was a distinction Let's go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And we'll drop in at verse 5. It says, These twelve, Jesus just picked his twelve disciples, apostles, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritan, Samaritans, enter ye not but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's the same thing John the Baptist started preaching. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Their Messiah was here. And that's what they were to preach. Um, so there was a distinction. They were not to go to the Gentiles. Let's go here now to Matthew 15. Look at verse 21. Matthew 15, and then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon, Sidon, Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thy son of David. My daughter was grievously vexed with the devil, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Verse 24, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then here we see also, you know, Romans 15, 8, that Jesus was a minister of the circumcision. 
for the truth of God to confirm the promises of the fathers. So I think that's pretty clear. He was not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His ministry was exclusively to the nation of Israel. Okay, and is this an exception? Sure it is, okay? Because we know all the way back in time, Gentiles did become part of the commonwealth of Israel. They became proselytes. They became as a Jew. Okay, back in Esther we see all these things and, and we, we, we've looked at this many, many times before. They became a proselyte. Even Acts on the day of Pentecost, there were proselytes present. I mean, a Gentile became as a Jew. And they followed the Jews' religion. So, uh, but predominantly, there was this distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. But, under Paul's commission, okay, if I may use that word commission, um, he declared that this distinction from time past uh, was to be done away with. And it was no longer to be there. Um, so, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and, you know, just a question for you folks out there that, you know, maybe are listening for the first time or the first few times, and if you go to a denominational church, ask your pastor what these verses mean right here, and, you know, do it in love, but ask him what they mean to him, okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in, in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. So that was a Gentile's position and condition in time past, including Jesus' earthly ministry, right? Now, let's keep reading here. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who had made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So, the middle wall of partition between us and the only ones in the conversation here are, excuse me, the circumcision and the uncircumcision. That middle wall has been broken down. And then he talks about it in verse 15, having abolished in the flesh enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself twain one new man. So here we see Jew and Gentile being in one body. Okay, that, that distinction is no longer to be, um, it's no longer to be, it's to, put, to be put away with, it's to be done away with. We are now one new man, the body of Christ. So, hopefully these things are seen, okay, that it's one body, one church, today, in this dispensation of grace, okay. Let's look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, excuse me. <coughs> We're going to drop in at verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And he's speaking now that if Christ died for all, he was a ransom for all, and what we see in Timothy as well, whereas in time past he was a ransom for many, okay, uh, that all were dead, meaning dead in Adam. And that he died for all, that they which should live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, know we him no more. And I believe that goes back to his earthly ministry. They knew him in the flesh. And he was teaching and preaching to the circumcision, the lost sheep of, house, of the house of Israel, 
And Paul says, we no longer should be doing that. But it's the risen Savior that we follow now. The revelation given to the Apostle Paul for us. The risen Savior's ministry is for us today, not his earthly. Uh, verse 18, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. All things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So here now God is reconciling everybody together. Okay, that he died for all. Not just a ransom for many, as in time past. So Paul's commission, okay, um, that distinction between Jew and Gentile is to be done away with. He's reconciled the world. That's everybody. Now, continuing on about the comparison teachings between the Twelve and the Apostle Paul. The Twelve were commanded to preach the gospel of the kingdom. That's very, very clear. Okay, so let's look at Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 to 8. And as they preached this gospel of the kingdom, they were to manifest the signs, okay, of the kingdom to them. So, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10. I know we just read some of these verses, but um, I don't believe we need to read all the verses, okay? Um, we read verses 5 to 7, okay, and verses 1 uh, to 4, you can read on your own. He speaks of choose calling out the 12, okay? So, let's just read verses 5 to 8 again. These 12 Jesus sent forth commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, in any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preaching, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now he, here are the signs of the kingdom. Heal the sick, cleanse the leopards, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. So these signs and wonders were to be manifested and manifesting that the kingdom is to come. And even that Sermon on the Mount, when, when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, uh, there's things we can't do today. I know in time past, what I, myself, okay, used to use some of this Sermon on the Mount to, uh, as we call, witness and, and share the gospel with people. And when Jesus says, if you, if you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Um, I used to use that. But that's not for us today. But in the kingdom, when the kingdom is set up, okay, and if saved people, there are only going to be saved people in the kingdom initially, uh, if they look at a woman with lust, they commit adultery in their heart. Okay? See, because the, the law is going to be written on their heart. Uh, that's what the new covenant speaks of. So these signs and wonders were to manifest this coming kingdom, which is going to be on earth. Whereas Paul was to preach the gospel of the grace of God, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Uh, we'll read that just to verify what I'm speaking of. Um, chapter 20, verse 24, excuse me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear for myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So that's what Paul was preaching, the gospel of the grace of God, how that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay, That's the gospel message that saves us today. Not the gospel of the kingdom, which is the same gospel message that Jesus preached, but this gospel of the grace of God. And as Paul was preaching this gospel of the grace of God, early in his ministry, the, the signs, okay, that, <coughs> excuse me, that 
And, and the wonders that Paul did was to manifest the truth that salvation is now going to the Gentiles. Because we do know that in Paul's early ministry, they did speak in tongues. Paul did uh, heal people. And he did uh, perform miracles and wonders. Okay? And people will say, well, why did Paul do that? Well, I think this is the answer to that. And why they spoke in tongues as well. Was to manifest these signs that salvation is being sent to the Gentiles. And we'll get to that verse in Acts 28.28 28 here in a moment. But first of all, let's look at Acts 15. I'm sorry, Romans 15. Romans 15. And verse 14. Paul says, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind, because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. Remember, the gospel of God is to prove who Jesus Christ is. And you can go back to Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, and see about that. Okay, the gospel of God is proving who Jesus is. Yes, Paul preached the gospel of God, folks. <coughs> Excuse me. That the offering of the Gentiles may, may be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have therefore, where I have made glory through Jesus Christ in these things which pertain uh, to God. For I will not dare to speak any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by the word and deed. Through many mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So Paul says that, and that's why we see these signs and wonders early in Paul's ministry. It was to confirm that salvation is now going to the Gentiles. And he's preaching the gospel of Christ for salvation. And remember we talked about this before. When Paul went into the synagogues, he preached, he had to preach the gospel of God first. He had to prove to these unbelieving Jews in that synagogue who Jesus Christ was. And if they believed that, then he would give them the gospel of Christ, which is how they got saved. Okay? But it was these signs and wonders to prove and manifest that salvation has gone to the Gentiles and that Paul is our apostle. And while we're here, let's, let's look at verse 20, though. Yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named by Peter and the Twelve, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. See, this, I believe, proves also that, that Peter did not, or Paul did not preach the, the same saving message as the Twelve. Because he didn't preach on another man's foundation, meaning Peter and the Twelve. Okay? But he preached a brand new gospel. And there are numerous gospels in the Bible. I keep hearing that, um, you know, people that preach right division, the biggest thing in order is all these gospels. Well, folks, do your own research, okay? Don't listen to these folks um, that are wrapped up into this one gospel truth, okay? Because the gospel uh, of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the grace of God, do it for your own. The everlasting gospel, they're there, folks. We, we, we need to study the scripture, okay? And compare scripture with scripture to find the truth. So... The twelve were commissioned to preach the gospel of the kingdom, and the signs were to be manifested of the kingdom coming, where Paul was to preach the gospel of the grace of God, and the signs and wonders that he performed early in his ministry were to confirm that salvation has gone to the Gentiles now. And I believe that's what wraps up everything in Acts chapter 28, in verse 28. 
Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. So that, I believe, was why Paul performed these signs and wonders, okay, to prove to the folks that salvation is going to the Gentiles. And Israel, in part, has been blinded. And then if you go back and you read Romans 11.26, that all, all Israel will be saved one day, but that's future, okay? That there's been a, a, if I may, a screeching halt to what God ha, had promised to Israel. And there's this um, parenthetical time put in there for the dispensation of grace. And then when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, God will start that back up with Israel again. So, showing the comparisons of the two, under the Twelve's commission that we were speaking of, they were to baptize and to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And we see that in Matthew 28, which many, many churches want to take as our great commission. Um, Matthew 28. And, you know, I always wondered, it's like, in these verses here, it talks about baptizing. And we're going to look at Mark 16 as well and showing the baptism. And I, I never understood this, but I, I'm going to tell you how it was taught to me before, okay? But the twelve preached the gospel of the kingdom and baptism was included in that. So Matthew 28, and look at verse 19. It says, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. See, when we go back to Matthew 23, Jesus told them to follow the law. And now here in this great, so-called Great Commission, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. So, this is to Israel. And yes, they were to follow the law. It's not for us. And as we see, baptism was included in the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. And let's go to Mark 16. Okay? Mark 16. Look at verse 15. It says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, the only gospel that they knew of at the time was the gospel of the kingdom. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So, what this says is, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And of course, if you don't believe, you're not going to get baptized, you'll be damned. But, the way this was taught to me was, well, he that believeth should be baptized. Okay? They changed this. It doesn't say that, okay? Because these folks, they don't know what to do with these verses. Their so-called Great Commission says to baptize. And here, another Great Commission passage uh, says that they're saved by being baptized. Folks, this is about the Kingdom Gospel. This has nothing to do with us, okay? And we come into the Day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Again, many, many uh, churches today, you know, want to take this as part of their salvation. Uh, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Again, this is gospel messages. Peter preached the gospel of the kingdom. And they only had remission of the sin there in Acts chapter 2. But then when we came to Acts chapter 3, where Peter offered them the kingdom, if they accepted their Messiah, their sins would be blotted out. Sins being blotted out and remission of the sins are not the same either. Again, we've talked about that numerous times. So, now we come into the Apostle Paul. See, Paul was not sent to baptize. Did he baptize a few? Yes, he did. Okay. 
again, I believe that was in the early ministry, and he said he did baptize some. And that again, did Paul receive revelation at different times? Yes. Okay. He baptized, because that's all he knew at the time. I mean, that's, you know, people say, oh, you're just explaining it away. But it seems to really fit the scripture as we're going to look here at some of these passages, okay? So let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. Paul says it, you know, let's go up at, up here, um, verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you for Crispus and Gaius, lest any man should say I had baptized in my own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanas, besides I know not whether I baptized any other. So he did baptize a few, okay, not denying that fact. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but preach the gospel. To preach the gospel. Notwithstanding, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Okay? So Paul was to preach this gospel of Christ. That's what he was sent to do. Not to water baptize. Now, is baptism part of the church, the body of Christ? It is, but it's a dry baptism. It's a spiritual baptism. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 verse 5 says that we have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. What is that one baptism? That we are baptized into Christ, into the church. Uh, and that's what Romans speaks of. These passages in Romans. This is not a, as some would say, and I've heard it taught many times, oh, a beautiful picture of water baptism, okay? No, this is a spiritual baptism, folks. Um, Romans 6, 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Okay? Knowing that our old man is crucified with him, and that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So this is a spiritual baptism. This is not a water baptism. Water baptism does not do those things. You get baptized, placed, identified with, into Christ by trusting the gospel of your salvation, the death, burial, and resurrection. Um, go to Galatians with me. Chapter 3. And verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been, have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So we're baptized. We're identified with Christ. We're identified with his death. His burial, resurrection. The old man has been crucified. It's a spiritual baptism. And that's our one baptism for the church, the body of Christ. We have nothing to do with water baptism. Okay? Does not serve a place in the church, the body of Christ. So, here's a few points, you know, of the difference between the twelve and Paul. And hopefully, prayerfully, um, these things will continue to be clear to you that the twelve and Paul's teachings are not the same. Um, yes, we're all in the kingdom of God, but the body of Christ, the church, is not the same as that Jerusalem church, and we're not all in one body. Father, give us understanding of your word and where we stand in Christ and who we are. And... Um, 
can just help us uh, here at True Grace Bible Ministry to continue to teach the truth and love. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.